have mainly looked at the consumption due to heating and cooling, but I would say that the construction area is another huge area that actually causes the so-called grey energy that comes into being when you are producing new buildings. First and foremost, it is steel and concrete. With respect to concrete, there is a drawback that there is only little recycled materials in this respect. So with everything that we are refurbishing at the moment, as soon as we tear down buildings and build them anew, we are not reducing CO2, but are rather releasing CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. This is something that the policymakers have also recognized meanwhile. So they will certainly have a closer look at what the grey energy means for the CO2 footprint. And uh, there will be, for instance, the building energy law as of 2024 that actually pays attention to that. At the same time, we need to protect ourselves against these climate extremes that have to be expected for the next couple of years. The climate change is something that cannot be stopped or prevented. It is certainly coming. And now we have to really think about how to deal with it going forward. This applies for overall German level, but also for every single building. And somebody who refurbishes his or her house and thinks about what can be done in order to protect against this climate extremes. Concretely, what do the policy make plan? Well, at the beginning of this year, Robert Harbeck has provided his roadmap, and this was then specified further in the so-called Easter package. The Easter package is now was now approved by the federal government, by the Bundestag, and we will be hit by it in the building energy law, which, well, at the moment, or only recently, was updated with all of the standards for new buildings with stricter guidelines now they are aiming at the so-called efficiency house 40 standard this is approximately the passive house level we also expect that there will be even stricter provisions in 2024 with the respective provisions for the refurbishment of buildings and if you talk to policymakers, you can actually assume that there will also be some proof for the CO2 footprint. They also talk about digital building resource path, if you wish, where all of the parameters are recorded. So it is some sort of extensions of the building energy pass. At EU level, again, there are some very clear requirements. They call it the Green Deal, which first and foremost contains some requirements for obligations, a lot of money that will be invested in different subsidizing programs, but highly ambitious because we only have eight years to go in order to reduce the CO2 emission by 50% and 28 years before we should be climate neutral. And if we look at how long it takes to refurbish those buildings, well, we believe that the new buildings need to be usable for 30 years without the necessity of further measures. So the measures are being taken today, the decisions are made today, and they need to be implemented. Here, a visualization of the CO2 balance you can see that in most cases it is concentrating on the production, the material, the use cycle is very often disregarded and recycling is something that is not taken into account in those ecological balances and it is a clear will of the policymakers to have a look at the entire and overall life cycle which of course has very concrete and strict or strong consequences regarding our construction elements and components because recycling is something that is not being practiced all over. 
I mean, the technology is there. We've heard many different presentations. Then we have the two most important material groups, namely PVC and aluminium. They will describe what exactly can be done already today. And I believe that this is quite a lot. A very cool consequence of the climate change is heavy rainfall. We all remember it last year in Germany. Um, all Germans were really shaken by it. And if I ask some of my relatives and friends, I would say that almost everyone knows somebody who had a flooded cellar, meaning that water surfaced or these strong rainfalls, heavy rainfalls, can really affect every single one of us. Another enormous threat is overheating. It is a fact that in Germany and also worldwide, I'd say, there are much more people dying because of the heat than people dying because of flooding. That's something that is not being presented in any statistics whatsoever, because in most cases, somebody who died of heat will certainly, it will certainly not be expressed like that. And in France, they are recording these figures, and I tried to research that, and I've heard that in the week from the 10th to the 16th of August 2020, there was a surplus, a mortality surplus because of heat. And in the media and also in the policy, politics, uh, it is something that people get more and more aware of, that we do have a heat problem in Germany as well. And in the climate adjustment strategy, there are many different communities and municipalities that are preparing some heat protection plans for their cities. They make them heat proof, if you wish. And we can also do something about that if we look at the individual components of a building. Well, let's now talk about resilience meaning how can we make our buildings and apartments more resilient to all of those external and exogenous factors for our targets? First of all, it is certainly the protection of human lives, and life of animals. Then, of course, all of the material defects. This is something that is very concretely a problem when it comes to water. If you have a house, that might be located in a risky zone, you would certainly have huge problems to get insurance coverage for that. And if you manage to do it, you will have to pay huge premiums. So we believe that this is another opportunity to prove based on proven construction and structural components that there is a protection effect that will be resilient to flooding and the like. Then prevention of overheating, but also an enhancement of the microclimate inside the building, but also all around any building in a specific region. For instance, green as the buzzword, if for instance, you use green facades and also vertical gardening and so forth, or if you also try to improve the climate all around the building. This is also part of those climate protection plans of municipalities. And here we have the insurance premiums again and protection against heavy rain and hail. This is also something that you can protect against at least a little bit. And I think I will revert to that in a bit. And here is another thing, protection. If, for instance, there is flooding and there is flotsam and you see a truck, I mean, there are no real protective measures that would prevent you from having a vehicle crushing into your front door. I mean, this is something that you also have to keep in mind. So you have to find some sort of limitation or threshold where you say, okay, this is something that we can protect ourselves against. You can see that climate changes very dynamically, very rapidly. And on the other hand, we have the problem that in German and Germany and in Europe, we are really lagging behind when it comes to standardization. 
the European standardization is also sort of ailing or blocked due to some political discussions and we need to get prepared for it that in the next five to six years these higher requirements cannot be reflected or covered by specific regulations. This is something where we need to get active ourselves and it also gives us cause to define specific recommendations or requirement levels in order to address any such issue. Here it is first and foremost about using some calculation methods that are proven and well established as a basis, and they are then adjusted to classifications so that you can produce buildings that are in line with those improved requirements. With respect to some of the aspects, of course, the inspection regulations have to be changed as well, particularly when it comes to flooding, because these scenarios are more frequent now than ever before. And the current regulations are simply not then you can also try to define some combination of flooding, for instance, whether it's in the thermal or in the ground floor, perhaps it also makes sense to provide additional barriers, or also analyze some scenarios in which these barriers are activated. This is something, I mean, if you think of heavy rain and of the floods and floodings, it is something that takes only two or three hours. And perhaps it really makes sense to put up a direct specific barriers in front of your front door. I don't think that this is really practical because it's really so fast. And the requirements regarding those new climate scenarios, we tried to illustrate in this slide and we have categorized it in three different areas. For instance, build in, in the climate change, building in a climate resilient way, in a sustainable way, or in an energy efficient way. So on the one hand, it is about increasing and improving the energy and CO2 efficiency, then also to optimize sustainability and environmental friendliness. And the third new aspect is to have climate resilient construction technology and construction elements. With respect to energy and CO2 efficiency, of course, there are some well-known parameters such as improving the heat insulation. And I think it can be said already today that we don't have an energy problem because the sun is actually providing us with more energy that, than we need. But generative energy sources, well, I'd say that for the next 10 to 20 years, they're not, it will not be there in a surplus, which is why it will really make sense to reduce the energy consumption going forward. However, with respect to transparent building elements, we do have solar energy input that can be used. So at the end of the day, that this will also reduce the need for heating energy. We also have to make sure that the heating energy is not replaced by cooling energy. So we need to be smart and also provide for night cooling and shading instead of providing any air ventilation HVAC units. That can certainly not be the right move here in Central Europe. Then the CO2 efficiency also includes the CO2 footprint during the production phase. Then the second area, sustainability and environment. This will also include the area of grey energy but also recycling as an issue, meaning that also the construction industry, you get to real material cycle without producing new concrete, new aluminium, new steel all of the time, or new plastics material. So we need to have a better organization here in order to enable closed cycles, something that will certainly be a huge challenge going forward. But at the same time, it is certainly also beneficial to see that the long supply chains 
the stuff coming from abroad have become very cumbersome. So this has really given us food for thought how to do it in your own country or in your vicinity. Then climate resilience, having to do with flow, heavy rains, overheating, but also higher wind loads. And of course, also higher surface temperatures, which might deform particularly the plastic element component. With respect to sun protection, we have GTOT and FC, but also night cooling and storage masses, because at the end of the day, the user feels that the operative room temperature that is also influenced by the storage media and the surface temperature. We do have a performing sun protection, however, if it is not closed for different reasons, for instance, because the user is not there or the wind is too strong, then of course sun protection does not help anything. At the same time, of course, we would like to optimize the use of daylight, so we really recommend only adaptive sun protection, meaning that there's a sun protection that is attached to the outside of the window and also the right glassing and insulation in order to avoid overheating and use the solar light at the same time. Here about heavy rain and floods. Many years ago, we have already put together a directive for flood resistance doors and windows and the underlying infection regulation. Um, this is mainly something that is taking place in the cellars of houses, and there are some suppliers that are delivering complete concrete windows, but nowadays it is also ground floors that are at risk, particularly those with sliding doors, and for these constructions we need additional development, but we work on some inspection regulations processes to see how houses and doors react to streams of water at different speeds. Okay, so how should we assess construction elements based on new criteria? Of course, we have the classical energy efficiency values, perhaps by defining new minimum requirements. And everything having to do with the sustainability on production level, so this will certainly have to do with the eco balance and the CO2 footprint and so forth that would be suitable to this end. The only thing that needs to be done is set a framework condition or a frame for the framework condition. Also, the analysis of the overall life cycle, including the usage phase and recycling. Then the climate resilience floods, overheating, hail, etc. We need to also define the level requirements in this respect. We're also involved in formulating ISO standards of hurricane safety because the American laws and provisions are not necessarily suitable as they only close their windows to some important beams. And here we really have completely different construction materials. That might be relevant to protect ourselves against. And if you think of a hurricane and of a window that collides, you can see that even an entire house might explode because of the change of the internal pressure in the room. And this is life threatening if you think of a window that doesn't fold against a tornado or hurricane. The IFG Rosenheim is known for it, that they also look into different standards. We try to be as transparent as possible with our analyzing tools, and we will also try to avoid soft factors. We really want to provide an objective and solid framework. At the end of the day, we will certainly also develop some sort of label or benchmark for analysis and evaluation. And it, of course, all of those construction elements need to be comparable. For instance, if we have somebody who wants to have a climate resilient house, they have to know product A does a better job in that than product B. 
And as I said, these three levels of CO2 efficiency, sustainability, and climate resilience will be taken into account here as well. For more information, we have prepared a documentation that is also available on the IOP website with a very detailed description in German and in English, and please feel free to download it from our website.